Hey everybody, welcome back. This is the lesson of Chapter 7, Protective Equipment. Uh, we're going to spend a fair amount of time today talking about football helmets specifically, but some other things as well that are pertinent to the athletic trainer. So without further ado, let's dig right in. Um, one of the most important things we deal with when concerning protective equipment is how to fit it properly because oftentimes protective equipment that fits improperly is more of a liability than it is an asset. So we're going to take a look at how we select, fit, and maintain protective equipment. In many cases, that's really not your role as an athletic trainer. If you're at the college level, then that's going to be handled by the equipment staff. But uh, at smaller high schools, even smaller colleges, uh, you may either do it yourself or you may assist with the equipment staff. And if something's not working or if athletes are being injured or you feel like there's a better product out there, then it's important to you from a prevention standpoint to understand what that is. So don't just blow this off and think that it's not important to you. Especially in contact and collision sports, protection is critical. But even in non-contact sports, uh, baseball, softball is a great example. Plenty of injuries can be prevented through the use of proper headgear to use proper trunk and thorax protection. All right, now, there are safety standards that exist for protective equipment as well as facilities. We're going to spend uh, all of today's lesson talking about equipment rather than facilities. But the standards are much the same. Um, a, the item needs to be up to standard to begin with. And then B, it has to be maintained, and that main maintenance needs to be documented. Uh, there are a number of groups and agencies that are involved in standardizing sports equipment as well as facilities. Uh, the American Medical Association Committee on the Medical Aspects of Sports, AMA, CMAS, the NCAA Committee on Competitive Sport, the Safeguards of Sports is another. And then at the high school level, the NFSHSA also uh, helps develop rules. So uh, in addition to equipment, there are rules relative to uh, particular aspects of sport that lead to injury. So for instance, uh, the halo rule for punt returners in football is one that's certainly been uh, debated and, and uh, has been changed through, through the years. Um, I remember when the XFL came about, they wanted to really market and promote the, uh, the extreme nature of the game. So there was no fair catch, uh, and that was pretty quickly done away with because athletes were being injured. Um, but regularly, these sport organizations look at, are there any particular things that consistently lead to athlete injury. So altering where the kickoff occurs from is one example of that. Altering rules for how a defenseless player can be struck. So the, the spearing and the targeting rules that you've seen in recent years have all come about because of this process. Now as far as protective equipment goes, there are some, some changes that come along from time to time as well. So required equipment may change. So we've seen this in softball in recent years where the use of a face mask on a batting helmet has been mandated. Uh, at the younger levels of baseball, it is not necessarily required yet, but in some leagues it is to have a full cage helmet. So there are rule differences across levels of competition. There are also rules differences for uh, even at the same level for different organizations. For instance, in Little League Baseball, you can't use a big barrel bat, whereas in U-Triple-S-A, you can. Uh, and that's considered to be for safety reasons. So these rule differences are really the responsibility at the youth level of the coach. Uh, if you're talking junior high and high school sanctioned, then you as the athletic trainer need to know those as well. So we said the safety standards are important from the start. Those are uh, insured by NOCSA, the National Operating Committee on Safety and in Standards and Athletics Equipment. Um, these safety standards aren't warranties. They don't prove or otherwise guarantee that you won't be injured. It just means that that helmet design 
has been tested and has been found to meet the minimal standards that Noxie sets for that particular sport, whether it be baseball, offense, softball, football. Um, that initial certification is good when you take that helmet out of the box. However, it doesn't say that for the rest of time that helmet's going to meet the standards. So in those circumstances, those helmets need to undergo regular recertification and conditioning. This allows that equipment to meet those standards for multiple seasons because there is a considerable cost involved and that number's gone up pretty substantially since I've entered the field where helmets used to cost 100 bucks. Some of the newer designs are, are over 300 and so if you can get uh, you know six years out of that helmet then that is a much more manageable cost whereas if that Noxe standard had to be renewed and you could only use it for one season then that number would go up pretty substantially. Helmets are clearly marked with the test results so if they're a recertification then they will have a recertification sticker. So I've pulled the helmet off my shelf. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this or not. Uh, this is an old helmet. It's been taken out of circulation. I'm going to hold that up. Uh, there is a recertification decal on this helmet and this says that this helmet was good to go for 2000. Uh, it, this would not be able to be, even though it's recertified and it's never been used since it was recertified, uh, because that certification is so old, it couldn't be used. This particular helmet design is no longer produced by Riddell. Uh, there are some versions of this helmet still in use. Uh, if they are, have successfully been recertified, but no helmet more than 10 years old is allowed to be used in competitive play. Uh, but they do make for good uh, decoration in my office. Now, uh, we said that the, the rules dictate what can and cannot, what's recommended, what's required. Uh, so we're going to look at that a little bit. Obviously, in a sport like football, um, football helmets are required. So we're going to take a look at the major manufacturers, the differences between them. Uh, lots of times you may wonder, you know, why is this so important? I'm not, I don't want to be an equipment manager. Well, it is pertinent because the way you remove the face mask varies depending on the design of helmet that you use. And that's important in an emergency situation, which we'll talk about later in the semester. So the first one is the Riddell. Um, there are several different styles of Riddell currently available. Um, the IQ hit system, you see these little red potentiometers in here. These are designed to actually measure the g-forces encountered by the athlete as they uh, are participating. And this system can actually be set up with a sideline monitoring unit that will send an alert to your phone or with a standalone pager so that if an athlete encounters a blow above threshold, you're automatically notified of who it is so that you can check them out. Okay. The revolution we'll look at in just a second. Revo Speed is this one here. Um, it is kind of a redesign of the revolution. But if you notice, the revolution and the speed both have a lot more substantial um, helmet, and the helmet ties into the face guard, uh, and that is to prevent a, a blow in the jaw from essentially jarring the, uh, the base of the brain. Uh, the VSR-4, that's the helmet I just showed you, that's been discontinued, but you'll still see a few of them as they are being phased out. Uh, a lot of these helmets have gone to this quick release, so you see you can use a paper clip or a, a Phillips screwdriver, a small one, and you push that button and it will release and the helmet face guard can come right off. So Riddell kind of rethought how we looked at football helmets and when they introduced the, the revolution, uh, they, they actually gathered up as much video footage as they could from confirmed concussion hits uh, over a span of over 20 years. And what they gathered, they triangulated that data and they found that hits to the mandible area were far more likely to result in concussion. So they fortified that area. Uh, previously the face guard attached on the sides and on the top, but it didn't attach 
low on the sides. So uh, they basically use the, the bar, the coated bar steel of the face guard to prevent flex. So I'm going to grab a helmet and show you this real quick. All right, so the first thing I'm going to show you is uh, this is actually a youth helmet. This is not intended for use at the college level. So this shell is actually thinner than you would see. You know, if this were in use by UTEP, it'd be thicker than this. But still, uh, it will really demonstrate my point. So if I take this helmet, you'll notice that there's tons of flex here. So this helmet went on an athlete's head, and they took a blow. That shell would basically just flex, compress the jaw right up into the mandible and into the base of the brain. So what Rudell tried to do is eliminate that shell flex. So this face guard is now tied in and it's impossible for the, the mandible area at least to compress like the old design did. Now interestingly, uh, Rudell has worked to eliminate that flex, but if you look at the newer design, uh, a lot of the, the newer now how much you see have a big kind of horseshoe shaped cutout here and those are called the speed flex and that is intended to absorb force to the crown of the skull so the, the shell will actually deform slightly there's padding up underneath it uh, but unlike the jaw where we're directly impacting the base of the brain the crown of the helmet is intended to flex and absorb those forces. So that's the newest design on the market right now is that Revolution Speed Flex. Okay, another brand is uh, Shut Athletics. Uh, they have a few different designs and the biggest thing you notice here is this Ion 4D and there's a link here if you, uh, if you go to YouTube and Google uh, Ion 4D face guard. Uh, you can see a video on how this is removed. This has done away with the side clips that we see in the older designs completely. and They have what they call an energy wedge. So there's just really two clips that hold this in place. You either unscrew or clip those off and that face guard will pull right out. But if you notice, those attachment points are higher. They're up on the head rather than down by the jaw. So these still have that same problem the jaw pads flexing. Okay. Uh, the Shut Elite is kind of a, a redesign of their older version and then the DNA which has this special Skydex padding that's supposed to be extra good and uh, absorb force. Uh, Shut utilizes these quarter turn fasteners so instead of having to use a screwdriver to unscrew that all the way off we got patient in an emergency situation. You actually just have to turn that screw a quarter of a turn and it will disengage. The Air XP is basically a redesign of uh, Shutt's classic helmet. Um, the Arizona helmet I have on the shelf back there is an example of that. The DNA is really Shutt's uh, first attempt at redesigning the helmet. It does have a much larger shell. The athletes I worked with didn't like this because it felt like a bobblehead. They felt like they were more likely to encounter contact. Um, face guards that fit on old shell, shut helmets won't fit on this shell. Uh, they did have an antibacterial treatment and uh, a special padding. But basically the take-home message here is uh, a lot of these manufacturers are struggling to try to bring high-tech materials into football to try to reduce the risk of concussion due to the, you know, all the negative publicity that the NFL has had from CTE, from concussions, and that's trickled down into all of this. The 4D is their newest version, as we said, they use these energy wedges. Uh, if you notice, the chin strap ties into the face guard, which could complicate things if you're trying to remove this thing. but. Uh, really nothing revolutionary in terms of how it protects the jaw area. The Adams, I showed you that UTEP helmet, it is an example of an, it's a bike, but bike was bought out by Adams. And this was marketed as, you know, a revolutionary new football helmet in the early 2000s because it was so lightweight and uh, uh, 
air flow through it was better. But these are not very popular at higher levels. They are lightweight, which is good for youth, but that lightweight comes because they have a thin shell and they're prone to crack, especially around these larger holes. Uh, a lot of times, I've heard from equipment managers at least, that these don't recertify nearly as often as some of the other designs. I don't have an example of this one. Uh, these are, are the newest of the bunch, uh, Zenith. Uh, this company was actually started by a, a bunch of engineers that worked in the automotive industry for, for quite some time, and they developed this, what they call a shock bonnet, and these are uh, lastimer uh, pucks of sorts, and, and the, the portion that sits on the athlete's head is attached to an outer shell by these elastomer pucks, and that helmet will move independent of the bonnet, so they call this a shock bonnet, it's intended to uh, help the head move independent and uh, basically they've created these kind of crumple zones like you would see in a car to minimize force transfer to the athlete. Uh, the face guard removes much the same way. The bottom line on football helmets is despite all the technology there's really not any evidence yet that these new designs significantly alter or uh, minimize the risk of concussion. There were some studies early about the Riddell Revolution, but there were some flaws in that study. Um, first of all, it was funded by the Riddell company, so there's, there was a concern that there's some bias there. Secondly, the Riddell helmets were brand new and they were being compared to other manufacturers' helmets that have been recertified for up to 10 years in some circumstances. So, kind of hard to say whether or not that reduction in concussion rate was due to the helmet or <coughs> rather due to the fact that it was a new helmet regardless of the style. Another thing to consider with that study was that uh, even though the risk of concussion was only slightly reduced, the severity of concussion was actually significantly reduced. So uh, athletes that took uh, you know, a week to ten days to recover in the one design took two weeks, three weeks, in the other. So uh, that was kind of a hallmark study. Uh, again, early 2000s when that came out. There's a lot of research in this area, so it's important to, to check out if you're interested in it. Now, as far as face mask, chin straps, we'll talk about eye shields in a little bit. Um, there's no real rhyme or reason here. It's really just what the athlete prefers. If you've got a neck or throat injury, we can look at the extended, uh, more lineman style face guards. Same thing with chin straps. We've got four point low that all hooks up down low, or a four point high where we've got two buckles up high. Um, it's really just athlete preference. There's nothing special about one versus the other. Probably the most important thing is how that helmet fits properly. So what we see here is an example of what we check for to ensure proper fit. Uh, first of all, we wet the athlete's hair to simulate they're sweating in the game. We want the helmet to fit like it would fit in a game situation. It should fit snugly all around, what you see the clinician doing here. It's using a finger or two to check fitment around the cheeks, make sure the occiput or the base of the skull is covered. Uh, we got two finger widths above the eyebrow. Uh, he's checking alignment with the ear holes to make sure the helmet's not too high or too low. Uh, we should have two finger widths between the face guard and the bridge of the nose. And then what you notice here, the athlete's pulling their neck, isometrically contracting, and the clinician is trying to rotate the helmet, pull it up or down, compress it down, uh, just to make sure that it fits properly, snugly, not tightly. For neck protection, um, really there's only one that's, that you're gonna see in use now that's a, a cowboy collar and even that you don't see very often anymore. These were really popular back in the 80s. Um, anymore you can adjust the, uh, the shoulder pads quite a lot to, uh, to get the kind of fit that you want. I haven't seen one of these foam neck rolls in probably 15 years on an athlete on the football field. The whole purpose behind all these designs is to just prevent extension. Uh, so if you've got an athlete with stinger brachial plexus problems, then this may be something to consider. 
All right, switching gears a little bit to ice hockey. Um, these, unlike football, it's intended for relatively slow velocity but high mass collisions. Hockey helmets have to be kind of a little bit of everything. Um, in baseball, we're talking about high velocity, low mass pitched or batted balls. In hockey, we've got to worry about bodies colliding, and we also have to protect the athlete from a puck. So, uh, hockey helmets have to to uh, serve a lot of purposes. Um, the helmet is designed to disperse force over a larger area, and uh, unlike in the U.S. where we've got NOXA standards, uh, the CSA, the Canadian Standards Association, cert certifies hockey helmets. Now, you may see a NOXA seal on some of these. Nike makes these. Uh, they're marketed in the U.S. You may see that NOXA seal there, but in order to play in many leagues, it has to be CSA approved in addition. Okay, so with uh, baseball, softball related helmets, uh, these have to withstand high velocity impacts. Um, research has indicated the helmet doesn't do a whole lot to dissipate the energy of the ball. It does protect the athlete against the direct blow, but there is concern that it doesn't protect them against the concussion that could occur there. Um, some have suggested additional external padding in the last video I showed you, we showed you the skull cap with the foam on the outside. We've kind of ruled that out for use in concussion prevention, but there's some that suggest that that would be beneficial for baseball or softball. These are required to be NOXA certified, so whether it's a batting helmet for baseball, softball is said with a protective cage, or a catcher's mask uh, or a umpire's mask, uh, they all have to be NOXA approved. Cycling helmets uh, typically are not NOXA approved. Uh, lots of times these are just thin or, or uh, formed foam with thin plastic over the top. Uh, many states do require the use of cycling helmets, especially for kids. Um, and these are designed to protect the head during one single impact. So in other words, if you crash with your cycling helmet, you're supposed to throw it away and get a new one all the other helmets we've talked about so far. Lacrosse, never worked lacrosse. I've never been at a school that had lacrosse, but I know it's popular, especially on the East Coast. Um, women's, women's lacrosse only requires eye guards, whereas men's lacrosse requires full cage helmets. Um, these are protect the athletes from uh, thrown uh, ball. It's also intended to protect them from collision with opposing players. And then if you notice the, the eye guard, face guard area is relatively small so that the ball can't uh, penetrate and contact the eye. Uh, the goalie helmet adds the throat protector because they're more likely, I mean, they're going to see more balls thrown in their direction. Um, but again, I'm certainly no expert in this area. I'm just telling you what I've learned from the textbook. Soccer headgear is an area of increasing concern, the risk of youth concussions and heading in soccer. Uh, this is basically just a headband with foam padding. There's no research that supports the fact that this is effective in reducing the risk of concussion. Um, some leagues are either requiring the headgear, outlawing heading altogether, um, because concussions in soccer are a pretty serious problem. For face protection, we've got uh, the general face guard, we'll see this as a fielding mask in softball, for instance. Um, there are a lot of options available here. In high school hockey, all of the masks are required to have uh, a Hockey Equipment Certification Council uh, certified mask. Uh, you won't see that in the NHL, but you do see it at the lower levels. Uh, the opening has to be small enough to prevent a stick or a puck from striking. So some of these will be coated steel cages. Some of these are clear polycarbonate uh, masks that, that basically just cover the face. Um, some are a combo where you've got a wire mask down low and a polycarbonate eye shield above. Uh, it really doesn't matter just as long as a stick or a puck couldn't get to the eye. Uh, throat protection, on the other hand, um, you'll see this in Little League Baseball, uh, even though uh, my son's a catcher, and even though he had a full face mask, he had to have the, uh, the throat protection as well. 
uh, that was invented by a guy who used to catch for the Dodgers by the name of Mike Sosha, who actually invented that himself. Um, and we've actually had umpires, officials uh, tell us, unless we put that on our catch, you know, we substitute out one of them had it on his mask, one didn't. We had to swap that guard over and they wouldn't let him play. Um, so it, that is monitored. Okay, other things to consider for face protection is the use of a mouth guard. Um, these, uh, and this is not substantiated fact, but a lot of manufacturers will tell you this, is that a properly fit mouth guard actually creates a little distraction at the TMJ. And we already talked about those Riddell studies looking at the blow to the jaw. Um, these are reported to reduce the risk of concussion, not substantiated. They do have evidence to support the fact that this can reduce the risk and the severity of dental injuries. What you see here, these are what are called dip and suck or boil and bite mouth guards, um, commercially available. You basically just dip them in hot water, boiling water, place them in your mouth, uh, bite down, suck down on them, and they'll form a little bit. Um, they don't fit nearly as well as the custom fit where we make an impression. We use a machine like this. This is a heating unit. We place uh, a slab or a slice rather of uh, plastic in this drum, heats it up, flip this out of the way, slam it down over this uh, dental model and it pressurizes the chamber and we get a mouth guard that fits really, really well. These make it hard to breathe, they make it hard to talk, uh, whereas the custom fit uh, much easier to do both those things. So. Places I've been, we use this on the entire team. Other places, I might just do like the quarterbacks and linebackers who needed to talk. Basketball players tend to prefer these. Uh, baseball players, if they wanted to wear one, you know, a catcher might wear this. You'll also see this in uh, motorsports. They might wear a, a custom fit mouth guard like this. Uh, on, you know, if they crash, it's intended to protect them. Some other things available here. Uh, so you see uh, eye guards, eye protection in various sports. Here's the throat protector. Like I said, um, in leagues my son's played in, this does not count as a built-in throat protector. It had to have the attached as well as the built-in. So it uh, just kind of depends on where you play. The athletes shouldn't cut down on that mouth guard. A lot of times they'll do this. It's required to wear it in, in football, and if they cut it down, uh, they're basically uh, eliminating the protection between the molars and back, uh, and that's that's going to cause a problem. So what we looked at was dip and suck. Our stock uh, commercial um, would be uh, you, you, we buy these in bulk. Uh, either one of these, you can buy these dirt cheap at you know, uh, any sporting goods store. Um, the stock ones, you really don't form at all. They just come and buy it on them. You've got a mouth guard. And then the custom fabricated ones, these can run upwards of $200, $300, depending on where you get them. Uh, these are required for use in high school and the collegiate level for football, also ice hockey, I believe. Other sports uh, require ear guards, wrestling, water polo, and boxing all require these to protect the ears from cauliflower ear to protect the ear from water immersion, apparently. Uh, I don't believe they're watertight, actually, now that I say that, but in particular wrestling, uh, ear guards are, are a big deal. Uh, most high school uh, and college will require that, uh, almost without exception. I don't know that I've seen that in a long time where they weren't required to wear a gear. Okay, eye protection. Highest percentage of eye injuries are sport-related take a, either an implement or you know, a ball or a stick, something like that, into the eye. Um, glasses can be problematic. Um, eye protection for athletes who wear glasses can become problematic. Okay? Uh, so we want shatterproof lenses for sure. Polycarbonate is what we're looking for. Um, glass, glass lenses are prohibited. They, they're more resilient to scratching, but they're heavier and they can shatter, which causes a whole realm of other problems. Um, eye guards do afford good protection, they can limit vision, so some athletes don't like them. Okay. 
simple as that. So in a sport like football, it gets attached to the helmet. Uh, something like these would be used more for racquetball. Uh, you'd see things like this in lacrosse, basketball. You wouldn't see this in basketball because it's metal. But something like this would be allowed in basketball. Trunk and thorax protection is essential in a lot of sports. So you've seen catchers, chest protector before. Um, hockey pads will be another example of trunk and thorax protection. Uh, shoulder pads in football for that matter. Um, this equipment may provide protection. It can also be used as an implement. So we want to be cautious here. Um, how essential is it to protect the athlete from injury versus how likely is it to cause injury in somebody else? This is the reason we don't have non-yielding uh, plastic or metal allowed in a sport like basketball. I can't put an athlete in anything other than a cloth splint or a tape job. If I wanted to put them in a rigid wrist splint, uh, that would be disallowed because it poses an injury. No of the other players are wearing enough protective gear to protect themselves from that non-yielding surface. So uh, it's kind of the balance we're, we're uh, trying to, to strike here is we want to protect the athlete who's injured, but we don't want to expose others to increased risk of injury. So as far as football shoulder pads go, two types, flat and cantilevered. Uh, in order to fit properly, it needs to cover the acromioclavicular joint. The straps can't dig into the armpits. The neck opening shouldn't strangle them. And there should be minimal movement side to side and front to back. So here's an example of a flat pad or non-cantilevered pad. If you notice, these, uh, these are referred to as the cups. And these are the polyolets. Uh, these are mounted to straps. They just flip up and away. But the rest of the pad doesn't move. Whereas this pad actually has an articulation right here so that this portion of the pad and this portion of the pad will actually flex, uh, particularly important for uh, an athlete like a wide receiver who has to get their arms up over their head. So uh, you'll, by far away you'll see way more non-cantilever pads instead of adding that motion. Uh, a lot of times your skilled players will just have pads that are cut down quite a bit more, they're not as substantial, uh, but those are the main differences there. The polyolets and cups have to cover the deltoid and allow for motion. That neck opening has to allow the athlete to raise their arms up over their head. Um, the straps shouldn't dig in to the soft tissue. Uh, sometimes we can combine, uh, and I've seen this a lot, where uh, football players will use hockey under pads. Uh, something called spider pads, uh, just to add some extra protection. So here you see what we're what we're looking for. So the cup, the polyolet, um, the strap, which goes underneath. Most pads will have laces in front and uh, riveted straps in back. Some of the newer pads will even have straps in front too, because these laces do break. It's one less thing to have to. Uh, to worry about in the middle of a game. Um, so here you see that pilot uh, covering the deltoid. It's not exposed. If it is exposed, then the pads are too narrow. Notice how much these these are flat pads, but notice how narrow they are through here, so that the athlete can get the arms up overhead without binding. Compared to these pads, how much thicker they are. Okay. Other things to consider. Um, rib belts, uh, sometimes called flak jackets, these can mount usually into the shoulder pads themselves and they're going to protect the athlete against uh, you know, being hit in the kidneys, being hit in the ribs. Uh, these can be air inflated interconnected cylinders so it's almost like a jack jacket design. For hips and butt, uh, the old school style Basically, we've got a girdle that has pockets sewn in, and the pads slip inside, and, and they are replaceable. Uh, you can alter the thickness of the pad depending on what you want. Uh, tailbone pad here, so it goes in the back. Uh, the newer style girdles have these built-in hex pads, and these are 
honestly quite a bit more popular. The pads don't slide around. They're a little sleeker. They fit a little bit better. Um, and the athlete just overall looks better. So um, you'll probably see these more often than you'll see these these days. But you know, maybe some youth teams and such will still stick with this. As far as groin genitalia protection, um, sports that involve high velocity projectiles, we already talked about how Little League Baseball requires the catcher to wear a throw guard. It also requires a catcher to wear a cup. Um, it's just a stock item that fits into a jock strap or a sliding girdle, something like that. Some other things that you really don't think about is protective equipment, but socks, properly fit socks, can really protect the foot. They can support the arch. They should be clean, they should be dry. Um, they can help prevent calluses, prevent blister formation. Um, old school cotton socks can be bulky. They soak up sweat and they stay wet. Whereas the newer cotton poly blend are lighter and they do you know, they have some wicking properties so that they pull moisture away, which is better for the skin. Um, length really doesn't matter, but really the biggest issue I've run into is athletes will wear the no-shows and they slip down off their heel and they end up with a, a blister. So the longer socks usually will, will give us a little bit better protection, but it may be a style issue for them. They don't like the look. Okay, as far as shoes go, um, they do break down, okay, so it's, it's about more than just how they look. Uh, if an athlete's very active, then they need to be replaced. Uh, it's not uncommon for a runner to go through shoes every few weeks if they're logging considerable mileage. Uh, that shoe's going to break down, and when it breaks down, it's going to start to alter the foot mechanics, and that's going to predispose your athlete to injury. So as far as shoe size selection, um, you know, sometimes they like the style, but the style doesn't fit. It's going to really be a problem if you're at a particular school. For instance, when I was in Arizona, we were a Nike school. And if an athlete didn't like Nike shoes or um, they, you know, they had a brand that they really preferred, it didn't matter. They weren't allowed to wear those because of the contract in place. Tech's an Under Armour school, I assume it's much the same in most sports. Uh, so you kind of have to work with what you've got. That said, you can try different styles, and it's really about trial and error to figure out what will fit best. So the toe boxes area at the front um, need a half to three quarters of an inch of space from the toes to the front of the shoe. The sole itself provides some shock absorption. Um, lots of athletes have gone away from the older style air support or gel or shocks or whatever it is to more minimalistic designs and that's fine but if they're making that switch right away, that probably ought to be a more gradual switch or it can lead to some pretty serious uh, foot conditions, uh, a lot of pain in making that transition because your minimalistic shoes uh, have less cushioning and they require more activity from the intrinsic muscles in the foot and that can lead to a lot of soreness as they're adjusting. Okay, the upper is the top part of the shoe. Usually that's made out of cloth. Uh, if they're all leather, then they're going to retain heat more. The shank is the part of the sole between the heel and the quote-unquote ball of the foot, you know, the metatarsal heads. And then the last is the form on which the shoe is built. So let's take a look here. You see uh, the midsole, the toe box, we said we needed some room there. The shank uppers in this particular model of shoe is cloth. Uh, the counter kind of uh, hooks and, and uh, surrounds the heel. Uh, that Achilles tendon pad prevents blisters. Um, so, you know, every shoe is different, obviously, but the, the components are very much the same. In order to make sure that shoe fits right, approximate the conditions of use. So if, if the athletes typically going to wear two or three pairs of socks, then make sure they wear two or three pairs of socks. Um, if they are going to be wearing it after they've been on their feet all day, make sure they're wearing it about the time of day when they're going to wear it. Okay? Um, we do increase foot volume due to weight bearing, so it's not ideal to try on shoes in the morning. It should be snug, but allow ample movement of the toes. If it's too tight, then we run the risk of blisters. Okay, should break at the widest part, 
coinciding with the metatarsal heads. So in this particular shoe, we see these little um, scores in the heel. So that shoe should wear somewhere in here. A lot of your running shoes will actually have a full line all the way across that, or you know, a line halfway across and then two lines halfway across here. That will kind of facilitate that flex. Um, consider the width, depending on how wide your athlete's foot is, and then uh, you know, other things about the shoe. If it's not yielding, then is it going to cause problems? In the case of cleats. Um, Several different styles. What you see here is a screw in cleat. We can have these for football or soccer. Uh, baseball at the youth levels are usually man uh, mandated to be these molded rubber cleats. It's safer for kids. At the higher levels, you'll see a, uh, a metal cleat. It's kind of hard to tell if that's metal or not, but just go to any Dick Sporting Goods or uh, Academy, whatever. And uh, what you'll find there is that the adult baseball softball cleats are metal spikes and the youth are molded rubber. Uh, these screw in cleats, uh, the longer the stud, the better traction you get, but the more risk you run for things like ankle and knee injuries because uh, we're engaging with that playing surface more. Those longer length cleats are really only intended for when it's really slippery, if it's raining or wet then the equipment manager may put slightly longer studs in. Uh, but for most of the time, like a half inch is going to be about where they will, uh, they'll stay. Uh, they may slip a little bit, but it doesn't expose the athlete to risk of uh, knee sprains, ankle sprains, things like that. Okay, orthotics in the foot. Uh, these are inserted into the shoe. Uh, these help correct biomechanical problems. You've got an athlete with shin splints, which we'll talk about a little bit later, heel pain, even low back pain, knee pain, ankle pain. Um, it may be worth trying an orthotic. You see several different versions here. Um, there are a ton of over-the-counters available. This one has a little um, heel insert, Dr. Scholl's. They'll have a gel insert, something like that. Um, over the counter, these are usually pretty cheap, anywhere from 10 bucks to maybe 40 or 50 bucks. Uh, custom fit done by a uh, podiatrist. Uh, these are more expensive, on the order of two to three hundred dollars, where they'll actually make a mold of the athlete's foot and check and, uh, or, and, and manufacture a, an orthotic that will fit them exclusively. For short term problems that don't require a full orthotic, a heel cup might be used. Again, you can pick this up at a drugstore for five or ten bucks. Uh, they usually will have a, a spongy rubber or gel to, to provide cushion during weight bearing. So these can be handy if you've got an athlete with a heel bruise, um, something along those lines where it's just short term and you don't have to worry about it. Um, off the shelf foot pads, these are your doctor shoals, you know, your cushion insoles. These aren't designed for athletic use. Uh, they're cheap, they're easy to get. You get an athlete who is having foot pain, it might be worth putting this in their, their daily shoe, you know, whatever they're going to wear to class. But these aren't intended to be used uh, for running, cutting, that kind of thing. Okay. That leads us to ankle braces. Um, we'll spend more time next time talking about taping and wrapping, but this is a good alternative to taping. The research actually is fairly conclusive, in my opinion at least, that bracing provides uh, added stability relative to tape and it doesn't uh, loosen over time like tape does. Uh, little to no impact on performance, so in other words an athlete doesn't run a slower 40 yard dash in braces versus in not, not wearing braces. Um, research has looked at impact on proprioceptive effects, so this is where tape can sometimes be more beneficial because it forms to the skin better. Um, so uh, it kind of depends on a number of things. We'll, we'll spend more time talking about this next time when we talk about taping, but just know that several different styles out there. This is a lace-up, you know, super cheap $12, $15 brace, something like uh, an active ankle with a, a hinge in it. It's going to be a little bit more. Something like a, a Malaya lock like this is rigid but also still has some uh, 
uh, inversion support. Uh, these can run upwards of 70, 80 bucks a piece. Shin and lower leg. Uh, I've never personally worked with soccer, but I've used a lot of soccer gear. Shin guards from soccer are very versatile. You get an athlete that gets kicked during football practice, then a, a soccer a shin guard can be very beneficial. Um, also used in field hockey, and uh, you know, it's not a bad idea to have a couple of sizes, pairs of these laying around for use if you've got an athlete with any kind of shin contusion. We've already looked at football girdle thigh and upper, or thigh rather, but we haven't really looked at upper leg. Um, this is a neoprene sleeve. This might be useful for something like a, an adductor strain, a groin strain, um, high hamstring, high quad strain. Um, that compression and that heat retention can be uh, pretty beneficial. Knee braces. Um, these are used prophylactically in order to prevent injuries, and they're also used after injury as a, uh, an added stability. Uh, in particular, MCL braces uh, are, are used, collateral hinge braces. Um, there has been some concern that AOSSM, uh, American Orthopedic Sports Medicine, I'm trying to remember exactly what AOSSM, basically these are uh, orthopedists, they've uh, expressed concern about whether or not these braces actually prevent injury. That really wasn't their, their design or their intent, and especially ACL. Um, rehabilitative braces are used following surgery, and uh, something like this where we've got a, an adjustable hinge allows us to progressively allow more range of motion uh, as the athlete heals. Functional braces are used following uh, that initial period. So something like this would be considered a functional brace where they could actually play in this. They could play in this. Uh, this is a super cheap off-the-shelf collateral brace. It's going to protect the knee against uh, a lateral blow. And then something like this is just a, a knee compression sleeve. Okay. All right, we're getting close. Just a couple more slides here. Elbow, wrist, and hand protection. Um, compressive sleeves retain heat. Could be useful if they've got like a biceps tendonitis or a triceps tendonitis. Something like this, sometimes called a spider pad. It's got more like a fluffy or a, a thicker padding that's going to protect them against the direct blow. Uh, you get an athlete, you know, a basketball player who lands hard on the floor, you might want to wear this for a short time. Uh, a volleyball player who's going to be diving a lot, you'll see knee pads just like this, but every once in a while you'll see elbow pads. Uh, whereas something like this, this might be a post-op brace for you know, a, some sort of uh, elbow reconstruction or a, a reduced uh, elbow dislocation. And just like the knee brace, this is adjustable so that we can prevent extension beyond where the physician wants it. All right, lastly, uh, wrist, hand, finger injuries. Uh, we see things like uh, soccer goalkeeper gloves, offensive lineman gloves. These basically have added padding built into the glove. Um, these can be useful in other sports. I use soccer goalkeeper gloves and offensive linemen because they're thicker. Hockey gloves, much the same. They've got thicker padding. Um, so the point here is don't be so enamored with protective equipment for the sport you're working with that you don't consider trying other things because it can be beneficial. All right, well, that wraps up this week's lesson. Uh, next time, we will dig in with taping and wrapping. Until then, I will...